Okay, so with uh, that, I want to make a reminder about the final exams that I uh, posted some information about the final yesterday. There's like a packet. It's really just stuff from the textbook in terms of chapter summaries, the uh, learning objectives. Within the learning objectives, they list some homework problems. You could go into uh, your e-text or your print textbook and see those problems if you want. Um, and then there's a couple of problems from each of the chapter that are just given. These are sometimes the practice exercises, sometimes they're end of chapter exercises. You can look the answers to those questions up at the end of the textbook. If you're on the e-text, it's in the back matter. If you're like in a print book, it's just in the back. Um, and in case you didn't realize this, the, when the textbook is asking these questions, like give it some thought or go figure, and they're asking these questions throughout the chapter, those are all answered somewhere in the back matter. You just gotta go look for the answers. So, and then also some of the end of chapter problems are answered as well. So you can use some of those problems. Secondly, I posted some uh, things called Olympiad exams. These are given by the American Chemical Society. They're like a competition for high school students, but they're a good source of review problems. Only issue is they cover the whole range of general chemistry. So I'll go through and highlight the chapter, or, or the, uh, uh, the 1210 questions that you can focus on and the questions that you can ignore. Some, some of these questions are pretty challenging, but some of them are really good review problems that go through the main topics from the chapters we're covering. Uh, with that, there's gonna be two practice exams that post tonight on mastering. I don't necessarily think you have to do them tonight, but they'll be available um, come midnight tonight. One of them only has like 20 questions, one of them has like 60 questions. And then there'll be two like PDF exams that post uh, eventually. I think uh, um, the last day of class is when I have the, the plan to post those. Um, and so that'll be most of the review problems that you get from me to study from, in addition to a bunch more of the ACI, uh, ACS Olympiad exams that I'll be posting uh, marked up with uh, the 1210 content over the next couple weeks. Okay, so with that into chapter 11. Chapter 11 is just picking up from gases in chapter 10 and then into uh, liquids in chapter 11. Um, and so liquids um, exist because of the intermolecular force that's present between the particles becomes stronger than the kinetic energies the particles would have if they remained in the gas phase. So that's really the, the issue is, do the particles want to keep bouncing around a container or do they eventually have enough force of attraction that they stick together? So whenever that force of attraction starts to compete with that kinetic energy of that motion, then things begin to liquefy. So we'll talk about a molecular comparison of gases, liquids, and solids, get a quick glimpse of the types of forces involved behind uh, molecular gases, liquids, and solids. Then we'll talk about the forces and properties of liquids. Um, we'll talk about heat changes associated with phase changes. So we'll go through sometimes what's called like a phase diagram where you go from solid to liquid to gas and think about the enthalpy or the heat associated with those uh, transformations. And then we'll talk about vapor pressure, phase diagrams from there and wrap up the chapter. Okay, so we were talking about this slide last time um, in class, and one of the things we were highlighting is that chlorine is a gas at 25 degrees C, whereas bromine is a liquid, iodine is a solid. So the bromine particles are going to have more attraction together such that they form this liquid phase. Um, and so then bromine has a stronger attraction. It's because it's bigger. The atoms of bromine turn out to be bigger. That's what gives it a stronger attraction for itself, why it's a liquid make the atom even bigger, switch to an iodine instead of bromine, then you have an even greater attraction for those molecules with each other, and iodine ends up existing as a solid at room temperature. You can start to get a sense, if you know the phase of a substance at a particular temperature, you can kind of compare, relatively speaking, how strong must the forces of attraction be between adjacent molecules. HCl turns out to be a gas at room temperature. You can actually buy a gas cylinder of HCl um, as opposed to it existing as a liquid. You can dissolve it in water, but as a compound, it would exist as a gas. And so since it's a gas, you can sort of get a sense that it must be a weak intermolecular attraction between those particles, or else maybe it would have been a liquid like bromine or a solid like iodine. So then the idea of intermolecular forces is the if we kind of compare the range of different types of substances that we encounter, we've talked about ionic compounds, Ions have very strong attractions for themselves. Ionic bonds, the lattice energies were in the order of about 600 to several thousand kJs per mole, depending on the charges of the ions. Obviously, the higher the charge of the ions, the greater the attraction. The smaller, the greater the attraction as well. And so we also encounter uh, metals. So metals generally have pretty strong bonds with each other. They tend to have high melting points. Um, some metals, as they grow bigger, we found that something like cesium and like mercury actually have relatively low 
uh, melting points. Um, cesium is melting points just above room temperature was almost a liquid. If room temperature was 30 degrees C, cesium would have been a liquid like mercury. Um, but the idea is that the charge, the electrons that are passing around the metals are harder to pass around the larger the metal is. Um, that's easier to do when the metal and the atoms are smaller. But metals generally have pretty strong attractions uh, for themselves. That's why most metals have pretty high melting points and boiling points. And even some covalent compounds, maybe uh, bonding between things like carbon atoms and diamond and graphite isn't something we've talked about a whole lot, but a structure of diamond has carbon atoms where you almost have like a tetrahedral carbon connected to each carbon atom in like a three-dimensional lattice. Like every carbon ends up covalently bonded to another atom in like a huge array of just tetrahedral um, sets of covalent bonds. So if you think about a covalent bond, a covalent bond has a strength of like a carbon-carbon bond about 350 uh, kJs per mole. So you're talking about a pretty strong bond in terms of the uh, bonding in covalent compounds, pretty strong bonding in the case of ionic bonds, strong bonding as well in the case of the metallic bonds. If you start thinking about intermolecular forces, it's a weak force of attraction. It's a relatively weak force of attraction. It doesn't compete with the energies. If you think about the energy holding maybe two HCl molecules together as they start to approach their boiling point well below room temperature, that that attractive force is only going to be a handful of kJs per mole. So you're talking you know, maybe five to 10 kJs per mole will be the intermolecular force between two molecules like HCl. So the intermolecular force strengths are relatively small between uh, molecules uh, that are molecular in their structure and they're just having these intermolecular forces of attraction. So the types of forces that we encounter and the descriptions we give them are things like dispersion forces. This will be the force of attraction between nonpolar molecules. It's really the force of attraction that all molecules have as well, but it's the only force of attraction within nonpolar molecules. So take like N2, for example. Obviously, nitrogen doesn't have a dipole moment, triple bond. So a strong bond, that's like a 900 kJ per mole bond. But if you take two adjacent nitrogen molecules, not much attraction because there's not much charge to transfer. There's not like a plus side and a minus side of this molecule where you get some sort of built-in attraction. So we'll talk in, the, in a slide or two from now about like what the dispersion force really is, but it's going to be the molecule trying to like make a dipole moment within itself. So molecules that don't have a dipole moment have to somehow force themselves to move their electrons around in such a way that the molecule gets a plus and a minus side. And so it's pretty hard to do. That's why then that force of attraction isn't particularly large. But then if you take something like HCl, it at least has a dipole moment. So at least something like HCl has some charge so that the minus charge in the chlorine atom and the partial positive charge in the hydrogen have something to attract together with. They have some charges, so they have some natural affinity towards the electrostatic attraction of those charges. And so then if you make the atoms small enough, so if you make the, uh, instead of having like a chlorine here, you have a fluorine, and maybe you have also like an oxygen atom. If you have really small atoms involved, then you get a really strong force of attraction. So if you look at, say, two adjacent water molecules, the advantage water has over something like HCl is that the oxygen atom is particularly small, and the hydrogen, of course, is small as well. So you get an especially strong electrostatic force of attraction between the H in water and the O in water. And so this particular attraction here is called the hydrogen bond. So if you go back to lattice energy, you remember how lattice energies are stronger. You get stronger attraction when like ions are smaller. That's the same thing going on here with this sort of force of attraction. When you're putting the greatest possible partial positive and negative charges on the smallest possible atoms, so we're going to talk about putting this charge on like N, O, and F when hydrogen's directly bonded to those atoms, then we're going to call that force of attraction the H bond. So this is going to be when we have H directly bonded to O, H directly bonded to a nitrogen, or H directly bonded to F. The only issue with F is that's really the only compound. It's the only compound of H and F that um, really exists is HF. So we can get a lot of examples of things that look like ammonia, so like you can have NH3 as an example of something that forms um, hydrogen bonds with a nitrogen atom. You can also have something that looks like say CH3, NH2. You can have a lot of different variations of molecules where you have hydrogens directly bonded to nitrogen atoms. And then the atom of H and N, because there's a great enough electronegativity difference, is putting 
big enough partial charges on the H and the N such that they have a stronger attraction for themselves and they're going to more predominantly exist as, say, liquids, where other atoms, if you imagine CH3, CH3, where you have two methyl groups next to each other, two carbon atoms and something like ethane, not a strong attraction, so not as high of a boiling point, more likely to exist as something like a gas at room temperature. Water, of course, has a bunch of examples of things that hydrogen bond. You have water, of course. You have methanol, ethanol. Um, even things like ethylene glycol, which looks like ethanol with an extra OH group, can form a strong set of hydrogen bonds. Okay, so let's talk about the dispersion force. Um, so the dispersion force is the attractive force. Like if you picture, like let's say helium. So helium um, is something we mentioned before. It's the substance that has the lowest boiling point. Um, and so helium, if you imagine two adjacent helium atoms and say, well, how could they ever be attracted to each other? Like, would they ever be attracted to each other? In fact, it took a while to even convince scientists that helium would liquefy. You had to get to 4 Kelvin for it to do that. So you had to find cryostats that could get that cold in order to observe the liquid phase. But the issue is, if you imagine the two electrons in helium just kind of being randomly situated around the, the atom, um, what ends up having to happen is as soon as those electrons can sort of pair where they're at relative to each other, then the molecule can sort of induce a small dipole moment in itself. And so what this is doing is it's putting a little bit more of a negative charge on the side that has more electrons, a little bit of a partial positive charge on the side that doesn't have the electrons closest to it, and then the opposite atoms doing the same thing. So you get a little bit of plus minus attraction. The issue with helium is this doesn't happen until four or five Kelvin. This happens at a really low temperature. Something like N2, the molecule's a little bigger, electrons a little bit easier to push around, a little bit more what we call polarizable. So if you just make the atom bigger, if you compare helium to, say, neon, just go to having 10 electrons to do this instead, then you're going to find that the helium to, say, neon to argon, that you're going to have an increase in that boiling point because you're going to make it easier to induce that dipole moment. And you can look at neon and say it should have a greater polarizability. and then hence a greater boiling point due to that increased attraction for atoms within a sample of neon. So also, if we could just have more atoms, it's going to be easier. So if we can take an equivalent molar mass and just spread it out into two atoms instead of one, that's going to increase this polarizability as well. So H2 has a smaller molar mass than helium, but it has a greater polarizability just because it's taking the mass and it's spreading it out. It's going to be easier for those electrons to induce a dipole moment in each other. So the boiling point of hydrogen of H2 is actually higher than the boiling point of helium. And so there's going to be a few examples where we see just having more atoms to spread out a relatively similar amount of mass is going to make that polarizability easier, increase attraction, increase boiling point as a result. So let's compare having, say, one atom versus two. So neon versus fluorine. You see the fluorine has a much higher uh, boiling point compared to neon. Uh, they are similar, though, in molecular weight in the terms of just a single atom of fluorine versus a single atom of neon. So fluorine actually has a fair bit more mass associated with it. You might kind of look at the comparison of, say, F2 and argon and see that they're relatively close. But as we go up to the next group, you'll see a pretty big difference. So when we're comparing, say, argon over to uh, chlorine. So argon has a molar mass of about 40 AMU, chlorine of about 70. Um, Krypton's about 80. So if you're looking at chlorine versus Krypton, you can kind of see chlorine has a higher boiling point. One, it's a little bit more massive, but it has two nuclei to spread out. Its electrons a little bit more polarizable. And so you can also see neon to argon to Krypton to xenon. You get a pretty clear increase as you're just going to a larger noble gas, more electrons to distribute. And then again, having more electrons um, spread out among more nuclei is also better. So if you notice, the boiling point of xenon is still less than 298 Kelvin, so still a gas at room temperature, whereas bromine's um, sort of boiling points above room temperature, above 298, and then iodine's is well above room temperature. So size can really allow a molecule that's nonpolar. So notice bromine and iodine and 
and, and all these atoms here are nonpolar, so there's no polarity built into these molecules, but as long as you're big enough, you can induce this polarity in the uh, molecule so that they can have a relatively greater attraction among themselves than, um, than some other types of molecules. So let's look at what we call linear versus branch compounds. So if we compare two isomers of each other, so an isomer is a compound, or two different compounds that share the same formula. So in one case we have what's called n-pentane. That just means we have a straight linear chain of groups. So we have a CH3 directly connected to a CH2, directly connected to another CH2, to another CH2, to finally another CH3. So that's what we call n-pentane. So just like n stands for normal. So normal, just a straight chain. Um, hydrocarbon. If we compare that to an isomer, has the same formula of C5H12. Um, neopentane is the case where we have um, three C or uh, four CH3 groups connected to a central carbon atom. Okay, so imagine you have a central carbon, just like methane or dichlor uh, or of uh, CCl4, but instead you have CH3s at each of these positions. So that's still the same kind of carbons. It's still five carbons, still 12 hydrogens. Just a different way to connect the atoms together. And so having a ball of the structure versus having a straight chain has a pretty big impact on the boiling point. Let's compare the boiling points real quick. So the boiling point of the normal pentane is 309 and of this branch structure, 282. So you can see that branching isn't good in terms of boiling point because what it's going to do, it give, gives less contact between adjacent molecules. Think of Two molecules of pentane can get much closer together, can push their electrons around more easily, can more uh, readily induce a dipole moment in itself. But when you have a structure that's just a ball, it kind of looks like a big atom. It's kind of like the case of xenon is relatively big, but it can't really induce a dipole moment in itself because it's just a single atom. So the more branching makes it harder for that ball type structure to induce a dipole moment in itself, and then you have a lower boiling point as a result. So branch structures, poorer in the terms of uh, polarizability, and then lower in terms of their boiling point as a result. So let's begin to get into some of the dipole-dipole interactions. So whenever we have a, a compound that's just polar, and a compound we can know is polar when it contains some of the more electronegative elements, like NOF, CLBR, I, sulfur. So whenever we're noticing compounds contain electronegative elements, we can then uh, sort of predict or know that the compound should be something that we call polar. So the molecule here is also polar in the sense that it doesn't form hydrogen bonds. So even though it contains nitrogen, we find in the structure, if you're writing the formula, you'd have CH3 and then CN. The Lewis structure would look like carbon connected to three hydrogens, carbon connected to a nitrogen with a triple bond, lone pair on nitrogen. So no direct H attached to a nitrogen. So this compound here wouldn't form a hydrogen bond, but it would still be a molecule that we think of as being polar. So now by being polar, you have a plus side and a minus side. And that's really what we wanted to think about in, in the case of assigning a molecule as being polar versus nonpolar, is that a polar compound ha has that plus side. It has the minus side. So you get some natural built-in attraction for one side of the molecule compared to the other. So you get these dipoles that can line up very nicely give you more attraction to where this molecule doesn't have to induce a dipole moment in itself, it already has that built-in dipole moment, so greater attraction. And so then this molecule here, you could say that it still has a dispersive force of attraction. So you might say, okay, we get a dipole-dipole force and the dispersion force of attraction uh, present within a sample of CH3CN. So all substances we're gonna find have this dispersive force of attraction so the molecule can induce a greater dipole moment in itself still. So it can still try to induce a dipole moment, but then also has a dipole moment and hence has that greater force of attraction with itself as a result. So then we can compare or look at molecules like propane, not very polar, dipole moment is almost zero. So just carbon hydrogen bonds, not very polar. Um, replace the internal carbon, so the propane would be CH3, CH2, CH3. So replace that CH2 group with an oxygen, and what you then create is a relatively polar molecule, but you can make it even more polar if you um, have like a, a carbon bond with a double bond to O. And this is just by looking at the dipole moment. So if you look at the dipole moment, it appears that we make a molecule more polar 
when we have like a carbon oxygen double bond compared to the two carbons connected to an oxygen atom. So what we're looking at here is a comparison of one polar molecule versus a more polar molecule of relatively similar molecular weights. So whenever we make a comparison between polar versus nonpolar or two molecules that are polar where one of them we know to be more polar than the other, um, we can then sort of get a prediction if they're similar size that the more polar compound should have the higher boiling point. So we have the higher boiling point in the case of the more polar uh, compound. And so then the polar compound of dimethyl ether is still higher boiling than the nonpolar compound of propane. So propane only has a dispersive force of attraction, but we get the dispersion plus the dipole-dipole force in the other three molecules here. And then acetonitrile, that CH3CN molecule, has an even higher dipole moment and then has an even higher boiling point as a result. Now, the one thing I'll tell you on the side is I don't think we could have predicted for the three polar molecules just which one was more polar. Like, I don't think we, from what we know about chemistry, could have looked at those three molecules and said that the acetonitrile molecule is the more polar. But given the dipole moments, you can make a comparison. So given some information that allows you to see how oh, the dipole moments higher for acetonitrile should have a greater dipole-dipole force of attraction than the other molecules, giving it a greater attraction and hence a higher boiling point. So we can predict boiling points, polar, boil higher than nonpolar of similar size, and then more polar boils higher than other polar compounds at the dipole moments bigger, um, and again, if the size is relatively similar as well. Okay, so let's compare hydrogen bonding with some non-hydrogen bonds. Let's actually start with the nonpolar group of molecules here. So the CH4 to SiH4 to the germanium to the tin case here, these are all cases where like CH4, based on its structure, is nonpolar. So there's like no way CH4 could have been polar. Even if you put fluorine atoms on it, of course, it's still nonpolar as well. So when you look at this comparison here, you see that by making the central carbon a bigger atom, you're increasing that polarizability, making that substance easier to push its electrons around. So you're increasing the boiling point successfully as you increase the size. So just going from Silicon to germanium to tin is just going to a larger and larger central atom each time. Easier for that substance or those substances to push their electrons around. You get that increase in boiling point. Um, so then when we look at water, HF, and ammonia, you can already see that they're off the chart compared to like H2S for the case of water and then uh, selenium and then tellurium. So as you go from H2S to H2SE to H2TE, the issue here is that you're just like picking up that greater dispersive force. So when you go from something that's not very polar to something that's also not very polar but bigger, that increase in size is what's kicking the boiling point up here and making this trend go upward. But then why do we go up? Why is the boiling point of water so much higher than H2S? So if you notice, H2S is more massive than water. Being bigger and more massive is usually good for dispersive forces of attraction, but it's particularly bad for the sort of dipole-dipole forces are like the lattice energy type force of attraction. So if you're thinking of electrostatic attraction, sulfur's is too big. Even though the HS bond is relatively polar, it's not small enough. The sulfur is just too big, you don't get as high of an attraction. So if you put the hydrogen now on an oxygen, what you get is it's a more polar bond because uh, oxygen's electronegativity negativity is greater, but then oxygen is just a smaller atom. So it's really the size of oxygen here that really plays a bigger role and why water is kind of off the chart in terms of its boiling point. Now HF is kind of interesting in a case where it has a more polar bond, but it only has one bond. So water has two relatively polar bonds. HF has one bond that's more polar than water's bond, but not by enough to give it a higher boiling point. So notice HF actually has a lower boiling point than water. And then finally, NH3, you might say, well, NH3 has three bonds. Water only has two. Why isn't ammonia higher boiling than what it is? And the issue is just electronegativity is just dropping for nitrogen. So you don't get as big of an electronegativity difference. So if I had asked you guys to predict, just off of uh, not knowing anything, predict the trend of ammonia to HF to water in terms of the boiling point, probably really hard to ever get that right because there's a lot of things going on here. You're going to um, NH3, the most number of bonds who can form the most hydrogen bonds here among itself, but then uh, it just suffers in that it doesn't have as great of an electronegativity difference. 
So ammonia just suffers from low electronegativity of nitrogen, HF from just not having a second bond, and then water just has that right electronegativity with that second bond to give it the highest boiling point. Now HF's boiling point's right about room temperature. If you look at where this is, it's right about uh, 20 degrees C. Um, ammonia, I just want you to know that ammonia is a gas at room temperature. So just in terms of thinking of substances and their phases, ammonia is still a relatively weak force of attraction, even though we do consider it to have the hydrogen bond. Having the hydrogen bond is really important because it still has a higher boiling point than that phosphorus atom would with a pH 3 molecule. So if you make nitrogen bigger and just go down the row of the periodic table, then you get a drop in the boiling point. So there is something still especially uh, interesting with the hydrogen being directly bonded to a nitrogen that gives that a greater force of attraction than might have been expected otherwise. So we get an H bond specifically when hydrogen bonds to an O, an F, or an N. And that's it. So if H is directly bonded to S, no especially strong bond there. Notice the same thing with HCl. It's really like you might think HCl, it has um, a pretty big electronegativity difference, but chlorine is just too big. So it doesn't really have that strong of attraction with itself, has a boiling point well below room temperature, kind of in line with H2S and H3 uh, with the phosphorus atom. So hopefully this is giving you a sense of why it is that the hydrogen bonds being directly, the hydrogen being directly attached to NO or F are so important because it gives those particular atoms a, uh, a, a partial, a set of partial positive and negative charges with atomic sizes that allow for relatively high molecular and intermolecular attraction. Okay, so let's just get to a question. So we haven't done too many questions today. So let's just look at these molecules here and figure out which one's hydrogen bond. So we're given a few choices. So which molecules can exhibit, a, 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 exhibit hydrogen bonding intermolecular force of attraction? Okay, so we can compare the types of intermolecular forces. So if we're, what we want to do is think of the vertical columns here. So think about atoms. So atoms like noble gases. So the noble gases only have the dispersive force of attraction uh, when they're thinking about forming their like, liquid and solid phases. So the only attractive force between helium, neon, argon, et cetera, is this dispersive force of attraction. If you then move to molecules that are nonpolar, so like BF3 is nonpolar, CH4 is nonpolar, N2 is another example, um, I2 is another good example. The force of attraction between these molecules is still only the dispersion forces. So dispersion forces are the only attractive forces in atoms. They're the only attractive forces present in nonpolar substances as well. And if you have polar groups without the OH, the NH, or the FH groups, then they can have the dispersive force of attraction and dipole-dipole force of attraction, but no H bonds because we need the H directly attached to an O, N, or F um, on a polar molecule then that substance can form um, intermolecular hydrogen bonds. And then the substance still would be said to have dispersive forces of attractions. It could still try to induce a bigger dipole moment in itself. If you imagine a relatively long chain alcohol, so imagine like butanol. So a molecule like butanol, you can imagine there being a strong attraction of the H with another O of butanol. But then maybe the CH2, CH2, CH3 groups are going to be attracted to a CH3, CH2, CH2 group of another molecule. So you might imagine there being a lining up of the, um, the carbon chains interacting with each other with the dispersive force of attraction, and then the more polar groups of the molecule interacting with each other through that hydrogen bond. So you can imagine the chains of the molecule might interact with other chains of molecules that look similar in a way that they're going to be um, exhibiting and then using that dispersive force of attraction. So every substance, even water, even HF, even NH3, we would say have dispersive forces of attraction, dipole-dipole forces of attraction, and then also that H bond. And then the um, ionic solids dissolved in liquids, I think here we're just looking at the interaction of the ion with the solvent. So here we're just classifying that the ion interacting with the solvent still has a dispersive force of attraction. They can induce bigger charges in themselves than what they already have. And then they also have that ion dipole force of attraction. The solvent itself, if you just say, well, what about like water or whatever the solvent is, water would still have the 
dipole-dipole force of attraction, it would still have the H bonding. But here we're just saying the ion with the solvent, that that interaction is described as a dispersive force of attraction and also that ion dipole force of attraction. So the remaining water, adjacent water molecules in the sample, you could still say have their forces of attraction with each other. Okay, so let's look at this group of molecules here and try to figure out which one has the greatest boiling point. So within this group here, think about an analogy to like water and NH3. Think about an analogy to size as well. So give this one a try. Okay, so let's take a look at this. A is the right answer. So A and D is the right answer. Okay, so the things that this problem is relying on are two different details. One is that it's almost like we need to remember ammonia is lower boiling, then HF, then water. And so if you, if you replace um, one of the hydrogens on NH3 with a CH3 group, you replace one of the things on water as well, one of the hydrogens with the CH3, that water is still going to boil higher. So like methanol would boil higher still than, say, 
CH3, NH2. And then if you keep going with it, like if we go to another CH2 group and add another CH2 group, what we're doing is we're adding to the size of the molecule. So by having a side chain, having this here is usually going to make the substance boil higher than if you just had a hydrogen there. Okay, because you get that long chain, you get the dispersive forces adding up. But the question here is really not so much comparing a different length of chain, because actually all of these have the same number of carbon. So all of these chains here are just whether or not we have a kink in the chain and we have a branching point. So if we have a branch compound, remember branching is bad for intermolecular attraction. So branching is gonna make it harder for the tails of these molecules to interact with each other. And so that kinking in the chain is going to reduce their attraction and lower their boiling points. Okay, so the ammonias are bad, or the, the ones with the NH2s are bad because the NH3 is lower boiling to begin with. So I think we can roll B and D out in that, that A and C should certainly be higher. And then when we're choosing between A and C, we want that long chain because the longer the chain, the greater the intermolecular force, a kink or a branch point lowers the intermolecular attraction. So branching makes intermolecular attraction worse. Uh, straight chain makes intermolecular attraction greater. So the key is that we still have five carbons here. We have five carbons here as well. So the carbon count is the same in either case, and the hydrogen count's the same as well. So we have three, five, seven, nine, and 11. So we have a C5, H11 chain, and then we have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 here as well. So the length of the chain is exactly the same. It's just a matter of whether or not we have one of those branching points or not. So branching is bad for intermolecular attraction. Okay, so um, another way we can compare intermolecular forces is to compare like the number of hydrogen bonds we might be able to consider between two adjacent molecules. So in one case, we have one propanol. So that's just propanol with a hydroxyl group. So we get one hydrogen bond here that forms between adjacent propanol molecules. So notice the molecular weight in that molecule is 60 AMU. If you compare that with acetic acid, where you get the C double bond O and then the OH group here, that you can have another double bond O pointing down, carbon, O, H, so you get this intermolecular attraction for two bonds simultaneously. So two adjacent acetic acid molecules have these two hydrogen bonds that are forming between their atoms in their structures instead of just one like in propanol. So if we can notice a case where we're gonna get more attractive atoms together or more H bonds forming between adjacent substances, we're going to predict a higher boiling point or see a higher boiling point result due to that greater attraction. So more hydrogen bonds, generally better, especially when they're being made about by the same type of atoms. So if you're comparing two hydrogen bonds among CO and H atoms, if you have then um, two of those, it's better than having just one of those. So two H bonds better than one H bond. We can then compare um, these substances here, like glucose compared to dodecane, bromine, radon, xenon. These are all relatively similar in their molecular weights. So we have a molecular weight of 180 for glucose. Now, glucose has a bunch of these OH groups here. I have one, two, three, four, five hydroxyl groups on a glucose molecule, or five OH groups. So I have five different points of contact that adjacent or other glucose molecules in a sample of glucose could interact with in this molecule. So I have a lot of H bonds that can form. I also have a pretty big size, but compare that to a nonpolar molecule of the same size. And notice that the, um, at, at first glance, you might think that they're similar in their boiling points, but glucose is gonna decompose at its melting point. So it's really hard to get glucose to boil if it just is gonna simply like caramelize whenever you hit its melting point. So the glucose uh, boiling point is probably well above a couple hundred degrees C if it were able to actually boil like an ordinary substance does, like dodecane. So dodecane has a melting point though of minus 10 degrees C. So notice how the melting point of dodecane, similar structure, um, a lot of size, so it's still like a liquid at room temperature, um, but it boils relatively high because it has a lot of dispersive force of attraction due to having a bunch of atoms. But then if you have a bunch of atoms like glucose that have H bonds on them, even better. So it has a much higher melting point. It would have had a higher boiling point, but again, it just simply decomposes before it gets there. And then bromine. 
If we take sort of the mass of dodecane and center it on two atoms instead of one, that's not particularly good for boiling point. So the melting point and the boiling point are particularly lower for Br2 compared to dodecane. So the boiling point's lower. So the points of contact are reduced. It's harder to push those electrons around in Br2 as they are in a long chain molecule that has a bunch of atoms. So having more atoms is better in the case of intermolecular attraction 215 compared to 60. And then if you reduce that mass down to like one atom, that's not good either. So if you go back to a noble gas with a relatively similar size, radon, a little bit larger in molar mass than bromine, but still a fair bit lower in boiling point. Same thing with xenon, even lower because it's smaller. So having one atom way worse than two, having two generally worse than having 22 atoms. Okay, so this one here, we'll open this one up and just do this one together. Um, so let's see here, which substance can only exhibit dispersive forces of attraction? Um, so that's going to be basically saying which molecule is nonpolar? Nonpolar molecules only have the dispersive force of attraction. So CH2Cl2, this is polar. Sometimes you can trick yourself. You might write this Lewis structure here and say, oh, that's two chlorines opposing each other. This is nonpolar. You have to remember this bond angle is really 109.5 degrees. The molecule is really tetrahedral. Those dipoles don't cancel out because they're really not 180 degrees relative to each other. And so this molecule here, definitely polar. HBr, definitely polar. And then this molecule here, the carbon-hydrogen bond, not very polar. And so we don't have a polar bond. This has to be a nonpolar molecule. So only structure one or I'm sorry, only three, only number three has that dispersive force of attraction because it's the only one of these three that we would classify as being a nonpolar molecule. And if you want to throw that in, you get a small bonus if you write two. So if you want to go ahead and answer that, make sure you get your points. Um, we'll be wrapping up and talking about lecture points next time so you get a sense of what your lecture grade is and hopefully have them entered relatively I guess like I'll just wrap this up by saying, and we'll get into this a bit more next time, is that properties like viscosity, we call ionic liquids, surface tension, capillary action, a lot of molecular properties come back to intermolecular forces. So you can think about substances that have stronger intermolecular forces have stronger properties that that property is related to intermolecular forces. All right, guys, we'll leave it at this and you know, have fun watching the football game on Saturday. Go bye guys. Oh, you're going to be on the, uh... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, I was like, why yeah. this H come on? But I was like, oh. Moving up to the big leagues. <laughs> Take you account of it.